Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. Driving one of these big trucks is a woman who, if you met at a truck stop, you would see what you think is a tough but fairly normal person. But this truck driver is far from normal, but in a pleasant, caring way. Bonnie is an interstate truck driver, but when she gets home, her life is about her animals. I rescue her. She had a broken leg when she was a puppy, and they were gonna put her down, and I said, how much do you want, how much is the vet gonna charge you to put her down? And he said, oh, $50. I said, well, I'll give you the $50 and take the dog. Bonnie's ranch is far from ordinary. Let's start with the dogs. I've had up to 50, but being that I'm driving truck all the time now, it's too much. 20 is a little much anyway. It's a lot of work. And I have a great guy that comes out here and works and helps me do stuff. You know, it gets monotonous, I mean, because, you know, you got some that when I'm gone stay in the house and they don't get out, so you know you have a mess to clean up. The guys, you know how guys are about doing that. But they do a pretty good job, I have to, I have to admit. But, because um, I got some really old girls in here that, that are in their, you know, 14, 15 years old, and um, they can't take this heat and they can't take the bad weather, so you just have to do what you got to do. <laughs> He's the one that brought the bears home. This is Reno, and he is a giant schnauzer. This is not something that's happened just all of a sudden, trust me. I've been doing this, like I said, for many, many years. I don't think anybody could have enough dogs. I mean, dogs are your buddies. That's the dogs, about a dozen of them. Next, exotic parrots. Ah! You shut up. Ah! You shut up. What did I tell you about that, talking like that? Give mama a kiss. You love mama? Oh, I love you too. He's very intelligent. He can do all kinds of little things when he wants to, but getting him to do it's another story. It's like, you know, I don't have to. Don't make me. From there, it's horses, about 10 of them. And then an unlikely friend, a fully grown adult steer. He's a very good pet. I probably could ride him if I wanted to, but he's a very good pet. Everybody thinks I ought to sell him, but I can't sell him. I, he's a pet. Shrek is a miniature mule. That's his mama right there. Yes, that's a bear off in the distance, and its neighbors do eat a lot. This is what the tigers eat. This is my so-called dispensary. They get chicken. This is what they're getting today. They're getting steaks, yum. You heard right, tigers. You have to try to give them variety. You have to give them chicken. You have to give them beef, pork. You give them horse meat. We do get deer in. This is the freezer for chicken. My people that work for me, so what I have them do is I have them take the chicken out, 
and I make them look at the label for the weight, and I tell them exactly how much I want fed every day. So for them to calibrate it, and then we have records that we keep on how much they eat, who didn't eat what today. Technically, USDA requires you to do that, but I, you know, I do it on my own because if something happens, I can go to the vet and say, okay, this is what this tiger's done all week long, and he has a better frame of mind of what's happening. This is what the bears eat. This is the bear freezer. We have yogurts, we have butter, we have creams, rice pudding, a little bit of everything. Their favorite? Ice cream. <laughs> if you're getting a feeling that this is Noah's Ark, you are right. Bonnie is a serious animal lover. Just think about what all those treats cost. Her two American black bears were accidental strays. The 750,000 black bears in America kill less than one person per year, and attacks in captivity are rare. But is Bonnie at risk with her bears? The answer to that is more about how they are looked after rather than whether or not they're dangerous. Contrast that with 26 deaths by dog attack each year, although there are millions of dogs in the U.S. alone. This is Bam Bam and Pebbles. They're about four years old now. They came to me. Uh, I have big black schnauzer I have. He's a giant. They were following him, and I thought they were dogs, but they end up being bears. And once they got the bottle and got realized what was going on, they became my pets. These are American black bears. Come on. Show them how tall you are. Good boy. Good boy. Good girl. Oh, mama, baby loves you. Mama loves you. I know. And these are my babies, and they've got really long claws, as you can tell. And they usually tear me up. There you go. Good girl. Pebbles, bam, bam, stand up. Come on. Come on. Good boy. Good boy. Hey, you're stealing them. OK. They're stealing them. They're stealing them. Good boy. Yes, sir. Mama loves you. I love these bears. You can get in here, and I can mess with them. Of course, you don't want to ever trust them, because they show no, no sign that they're going to attack you. I have been bit. I've been clawed. I've been knocked down by them. And usually, I carry a taser with me when I'm in here, out here by myself so I can get up. And she's as about as unpredictable as you can get. I've scared her and she's turned around and, you know, I walked up on her too quiet and I've scared her and she, she came at me. But, you know, it wasn't an attack. As soon as she realized it was me, she stopped. I can't express enough that these are wild animals and their mind can change at any moment. They can be killers in a matter of seconds if they wanted to. I have found with my experience with animals, exotics, domesticated, you feed them well, you take care of them well, you give them plenty to eat, they seem to be fine. When you start not feeding them and doing what you're not supposed to do, you hurt them, then they hurt you back. If you come at them aggressively, they're gonna come right back to you aggressively. Like if they're doing something, and she's wanting to bite me, I just change her mind and go, no, 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 you know, it's okay. You know, you turn the tables on them. And loud noises will scare them. There's times that, like, I'm doing something and they're being nosy. If I don't want them around, I'll slap the side of the tank and they run. I'm not a bear expert and never claim to be, but being with these, and these are my first challenge with them, I've learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's been trial and error. I think they're doing good. I think, I think I'm doing okay with them. I mean, some people may say I'm not, but they seem happy to me, don't they, to you? They're very easy to take care of. I, I'm really surprised. I've offered them meat. I've offered them fish. I put four rolls of hay out there day four yesterday. Look how easy they mangled it. <laughs> they go up in the trees. They get on them. They climb up on them. I mean, they get way up there. 
They come down to eat and to pick on me. Have you touched one? Come here. Bam, bam. Come over here on this side. Touch the butt. These bears can be dangerous, but that is also part of their appeal. And this could be why predator pets are popular. The feeling of being with these animals is a mixture of fear and fascination. I'm slightly worried now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dinner! <laughs> They're very strong. They can take a log and they can literally push it, move it wherever they want to. Oh, look at that! Is that good? When she comes in heat, she gets a little cantankerous and she can get pretty rough with him. But he doesn't show any aggression. He. He just does his own thing, gets in a different tree. <laughs> like a man, goes to a man cave. <laughs> but this is my baby right here. This is my baby. Yeah. My main concern is keeping them where they're supposed to be, keep them fed, and like I said again, as long as you feed them, feed them well, they're not going anywhere. And these guys here can't go back out in the wild because they don't know how to feed themselves. So basically they're mine until I die. And then when I'm dead, I have a sanctuary that's gonna take them and that will take them and the cats. So they already have a place to go. This way people won't have to say, well, she's an old woman. Where are they gonna go when she dies? Well, there is a place for them to go. And it's a wonderful place. And they will care for them like I care for them. Been there a zillion times to keep on different times and make sure how they take care of their animals. And I'm very impressed. I don't know how long they're gonna live and how long I'm gonna live, so there we go. <laughs> <laughs> they stand on the edge, and this is what happens to my $500 stock tank. Huh? More toys? Huh? For our crew, bears are one thing, but Bonnie's apex pets require a little more respect. It is estimated that there are more tigers in the U.S. than in the wild globally. Bonnie's younger tiger was born in captivity, and to Bonnie, he is just a big, playful cat. She's, you know, just that playful teenager stage where everybody's a toy and everything we have is a toy. No, 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 gentle, gentle. You notice how she has not hurt the dog? Mm -hmm. He hasn't yelped or anything? What are you doing with the water? <laughs> That's called chuffing. <laughs> she goes, what was that? Oh, 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 don't run, don't run. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh, are you okay? The concern is what will happen when the big cat reaches maturity. Incidents of pet tigers killing people are rare, but we have to always remember they are an apex killer. So Bonnie, one way or the other, is taking a risk. Ow. Do you want a stick, Bonnie? Here. Bonnie, here's no. a stick. No, I got it. Here, Bonnie, here's a stick. No, you stop. Now, come on. Ooh. Don't bite my leg. Not just with one tiger, her second one is a fully grown female. Well, she came to me seven years ago. She had ringworm and a yeast infection all over her hair, and she was pretty poor, but now she, you can tell she's magnificent, she's healthy. You know, and uh, she's not that she doesn't like that cat. She's just telling it to back off. But she's my baby, and I love her. Well, she weighs 450 pounds. I go in there and pet her, and I do I do ever clean the pen, do everything like I do with the regular, like I did with the other cat. But when people are here and the cameras, she gets bashful. So, and I think you know, I mean, she's back here in the back. She don't get. Uh, a lot of people here to socialize with her. If she had more people to socialize with her, she'd probably be all over us, but really she's a very good cat. She's not mean, she's not aggressive. 
you know, when she's scared, you saw what she did. You know, she kind of growls a little bit, you know, but I mean, that's just to show you to back off. You know, she's a tiger, again, you know, don't feed her, she'll eat you. I've only been scared of one cat in my life. I was in the pen with two cats and I was against the fence like this and they double teamed me. One come here and one come here. They've never hurt me, but it is definitely a feeling that, you know, okay, this could be it. <laughs> you know, but otherwise, I, I no, I'm not afraid of them. I mean, I should be, I mean, I'm very caught. Uh, let's, let's put that a different way. I'm very, I'm not scared of them, but I'm very cautious of them. You, you can't, I, I don't know how to explain this feeling, but I mean, I just don't have the fear of them, but I know they can kill me. I know they can hurt me. You know, I don't turn my back on them. Um, I mean, I know what they are. I know that they can be uh, an aggressive animal and they can be friendly one day and be an idiot the next day. The thing is, is when you're feeding them meat, get out of the pen. Why do you want to be there? They're eating. If they're having a bad day, why irritate them? Leave them alone. Let them just have, go through their bad day. It's a sense you have with animals, you know. If you have that sense, your chances of getting hurt is minute, you know. But if you're bullying them or doing things and you don't pay attention, then you get hurt and that's what usually happens with people. They're not for everybody, you know, and not everybody wants them. They're a big expense. They cost a lot of money every month to feed. It's not that they're a lot of work, but you have to take care of them. You have to know when something's wrong with them. But that's the whole idea of owning animals anyway, isn't it? Oh, oh come on, new stuff. Come on, mama, come on. Anushka. It comes from Alaska, and it means the first ray of light. So that's what I thought of. And then Sunita, the little one's name, is a Spanish name for beauty. But those are my children, as children go. The American bison is an unpredictable and at times lazy and unconcerned animal. They appear peaceful, but this large mammal has a temperament that is totally unpredictable. Bison roamed the plains of North America in their millions. Hunting decimated their population down to less than 1,000 animals. Today, things are looking up. The population is growing, and to one family, a pet bison is the perfect house companion, even if the house is a little A-frame cottage on the plains of Texas. People that don't know me think I'm crazy, and the people that know me know I'm crazy. <laughs> I've been here for 31 years, and I've been training horses for a living, and I use buffalo or bison to train my horses with. Yeah, I was fascinated with them when I was a kid and never thought about even owning one. I don't think when I was young you could legally own a bison. They're a little on the crazy side, and most people that raise cattle don't want to mess with them because they tear your pens and stuff up. They're a lot wilder than a cow is, and they're harder to handle for most people, but if you know how to handle them, they're almost as easy to work as cattle are. Sharon and R.C. are both extreme animal lovers. We both have the fascination with bison. I'm not much for the little bitty dogs or anything like that. I like the wildlife. And that's one reason why R.C. and I, you know, fit together, because we both like the wildlife. The more Western it is, the better we both like it. The first time I ever saw a bison, of course, was R.C. I mean, you know, in life, you know, I mean, I've seen them on TV and all that, but first time was whenever R.C. brought some home to train his, you know, cutting horses. After that, we decided to own Wild Thing and he become our pet.
Keeping a bison as a pet does have its challenges. They can weigh up to 2,700 pounds and run at over 30 miles per hour, and they can get a little grumpy. A lot of times you got to go in the pen with them, and you got to know your distance and everything because if you get too close, they're going to come after you or they're going to run away. And if they don't run away real quick, they're fixing to come and get you. They're uh, the largest land animal in the United States that's native to the United States. They can outrun any horse. It's always dangerous being around a herd of bison because you don't know when one's gonna attack you. And I have had them horn my horses and knock my horses all the way down on top of me. I've been in that situation a lot. Uh, one particular cow one time come after me, and if I hadn't had a jacket, I threw it on top of her horns, and I got out of the pen while she was fighting the jacket. He got me down one time, three times in one day, and uh, my wife had to dress me for three days. <laughs> Hello? He knocked me down. He was wanting me to be a buffalo and play with him, but Hello? I got to an ax handle and explained to him we didn't do that. <laughs> R.C. counts Wild Thing as his pet and his companion on the ranch. This big bison is, at times, almost cute. Wild Thing, of course, you know, I mean, he's a little orange calf, you know, whenever we get him. He's about two and a half, three months old. And uh, of course, RC's trying to halt or train him and, and everything, and he conquers that. But then I have a brilliant idea, and I said, well, why don't we bring Wild Thing in the house? Hello, Wild Thing. And he says, you don't understand. He is a bison. He could tear up your house. You may not have nothing left. And I, well, you only live once. You bring your cats and your dogs and your kids in the house, so might as well. So ever since then, we've been bringing Wild Thing in the house, and he's grown up with us. He has lots of personality. Even though he's a bison, he's got personality. I mean, if he gets his feelings hurt, he goes and pouts. And you know when he pouts, because he just has that certain look in his face and the certain movements that he gives. The wild Thing also likes to be pushy sometimes, but then again, Wild Thing can be loving. Wild Thing! Hello, baby boy. But only to RC and I. Only the past 10 years, I've been able to actually touch him and groom him. I mean, I'm always out there taking pictures of him and different things like that. I can wear fringe and wear big headdresses that I make with feathers. RC, he can't wear fringe around him, not safely. So, you know, and I think it's because uh, Wild Thing's used to RC being just a cowboy, and he's used to me being just out there, because, I mean, I am, I'm always out there. So he never knows what to expect of me. <laughs> but there's times that Wild Thing is sitting outside, relaxing, and I may kind of crawl in and lay close to him. I can't touch him, I can't lay up against him, because then he'll jump up. But I do lay in there with him, and then sometimes RC and I both will lay in there together. And I mean, you know, he can be, you know, seem real sweet. But, but he's not a, you know, sweet animal per se, you know, I mean, he is a very dangerous animal for others. Well, I'm afraid he might tear up stuff, you know, if we brought him in, but when I brought him in, it was kind of odd because he behaved himself in here. And then pretty soon I was leaving the door open 
and he'd come back and forth in the house. And But he never used the bathroom in the house. If he'd ever used the bathroom in the house, this deal would have never happened. He potty trained himself. I, I do not have a clue how you could potty train a buffalo. <laughs> Now that he's gotten big, we have to move coffee tables and couches around. It's like having a small car come through your house. He has a hard time getting his horns through the doors. We've had people eat with us before at their own risk, <laughs> but it's not probably perfectly safe for them, although I'm willing to lay down my life to save theirs. When the grandkids come over, we have to put up fences, we have to put up everything in the house. We don't have to when the wild thing comes yeah. down. I'd rather have the wild thing in the house than my grandkids most of the time. <laughs> so far, he hadn't tore up anything. He hadn't, he's just been perfect in the house. He, he looks at everything, he's real curious about everything in the house, but he doesn't tear up anything. A lot of times, as soon as he walks out of the house, he'll knock my barbecue pit over but it's outside. But in the house, he's a perfect gentleman. He's unpredictable. <laughs> in the house, he's pretty predictable. Outside, uh, he's really a crazy, wild, crazy animal outside. He's very dangerous for anybody else to be around. It's taken 10 years for Sharon to be able to go around them safely. And I still want to be there for her because I will attack him. I can't win, but he thinks I can win. <laughs> Always being the alpha, you got to be the alpha. You got to have enough courage to stand up to him, even though you know you can lose. I don't have a chance against him, but he thinks I can. Once I get him by the horns, he thinks I got him. It's a big bluff. It is likely that Wild Thing is the only fully trained bison in the world. His skills go beyond wrecking the fences. He pulls a chariot, plows a garden. He was her best man at her wedding. My boy's the first one to ski behind a buffalo on, on sand. And my daughter's the first one to snow sled behind a buffalo. He eats at the dining room table with us. Any crazy thing I can think of to do, I do it. He's the first one to ever pull a canoe. There are times that Wild Thing seems to get what's going on, even at a big event like his owner's wedding. I just thought it was something different <laughs> to do. I didn't know anybody ever know about it but us, but uh, I thought it was kind of cool to have a bison or buffalo as a best man. Our minister, he knew us already, so... He wasn't real comfortable, though. <laughs> no, he wasn't real comfortable, but he, he liked it. I mean, he thought he was neat, you know, and, and he only said, only for us, is not for everybody. Our wedding has been all over the world. He was a good gentleman. He did throw the rings off his horn, so... <laughs> I see him as a little baby. <laughs> I don't see him as a big, big buffalo. He's a baby to me. He's not big to me because I've raised him and he's still a baby to me. Yeah. And when you look at his little face, it just looks so sweet. So you just fall in love with him, you know. I have no fear of him at all, but I do know when not to mess with him. He's, he's moody. There's sometimes I know that I better leave him alone. There is no doubt that this is a dangerous animal. It could escape and cause a lot of trouble. But to date, Wild Thing has seldom wandered beyond his local street. If he gets out, everybody just take pictures from their porch, but they know not to go around him. Yeah. He, go he goes down the road about a quarter of a mile and fights a cedar tree. And I learned the first time I went down there, I better let him fight the cedar tree for a little while because he'll come after me if I try to make him quit too soon. Mm -hmm. So I let him go ahead and fight it for a little while, then I'll put a rope around his horns and lead him home. He's got a real big barn, and he has fans in it, and I water the ground every day because it's hot this time of year, and he stays pretty comfortable. Of course, his favorite place is in the house. 
I go over there and feed them every day. I can pour the feed in the trough. If you try to pour the feed in the trough, he'd kill you. He don't want anybody feeding them but myself and Sharon. I have let other people feed them through the fence and he'll attack them. RC treats Wild Thing with mutual respect, but it is RC who has to do the cleaning up. I just got a lot of joy out of them. I got to clean his poop out of the yard every, every day. And I'm, you know what, I'm glad it's out there so I can clean it up because I, I just enjoy them. I brush them every day. I spend more time with him than I do my wife. I'm in the pen with him when he's tearing up stuff usually. He may be throwing the canoe in the air or tearing the fences up. I stay in the pen with him. He's, ever since he hurt me one time pretty good, uh, he's never, I think he knows he hurt me and now he don't want to. And the hard part when we're filming or doing something out there and, and we want a video or something, I can't get close to him when he's tearing up stuff. But for the opposite reason, you think. If I get close to him, he's going to quit. Because he's going to protect me by quitting. So if I want to share him doing a video of him tearing up a fence, I got to stay back far enough that he won't quit. Because once I get in a danger zone, he shuts it down. He knows I'm his best friend because I never do anything against him. I do everything for him. Wild Thing will be here all his life. All of his life. Yeah, we'll, ne we'll never give up Wild Thing. He, he, hopefully, he's middle age. He's 12 now. And he should live to be around 25 at least, I hope. Mm -hmm. And he's not, he's not going anywhere. There's no amount of money could ever buy him. Mm -hmm. He'll never be for sale. Never. And he would be too dangerous for anybody else to have. And one thing about the bison, there are some other trainers. There have been other trainers. I've known four of them killed in the last five years. And they kill nearly all their trainers. And he may kill me, but I hope he don't. <laughs> and I sure want to protect her. It's hard to define Tippi Hedren, the Hollywood legend and star of The Birds, Marnie, Roar, and The Countess from Hong Kong. She has been an active humanitarian, creator of a multi-million dollar manicuring industry, and is the only actor to have worked on films with both Alfred Hitchcock and Charlie Chaplin. But her real passion is with the beauty and majesty of the big cats. Her recent biography looks into her acting career, but spends more time on her love of animals. Tippi is the founder of Shambhala, a sprawling 40-acre wild animal sanctuary a few hours north of Los Angeles. Shambhala is home to around 30 big cats. I can't even imagine my life without, without these big cats. I can't even imagine it. I mean, they've given, given me so much. Certainly on understanding the species and totally respecting the qualities that are inborn into those beings and what is in that brain and, and uh, what activates those instincts and uh, just getting to know these animals. It's been a great honor. It's been something that we have to have done to be able to give them the life that we have given them, to be able to understand them. We can't understand everything about them. Enough to really give them a good life. There's something very, very fascinating about, about something of great beauty. The personality of the great cat is varied and um, elaborate and dangerous and, um, you know, they can kill you. Uh, without even thinking twice about it. Well, I've always been in love with them, even before I even had a possibility of going to Africa. Seeing them actually in their own environment, in their own 
way of life and, and being free and it was an astounding time. Shambhala Reserve is not a zoo or an animal park. It was set up to take on the role of looking after animals that no longer had a home in the U.S. Some were dropped off at the gates, others have come from circuses or zoos, and many from private pet ownership. It is estimated that over 3,500 tigers alone are in private ownership in the U.S., with many of them now too large to look after. I don't know the exact numbers of them, but I know it has diminished because people are getting smarter. I mean, you, with the, with the uh, exotic feline, you're dealing with an apex predator. You're dealing with an animal who could just as soon kill you as just walk across the room. They are extremely dangerous. They have instincts born in them that can never be removed. And um, they are dangerous. Tibby Hedren knows too well the dangers. During the production of her feature film, Roar, tigers and lions featured heavily in the story. This meant working closely with a number of dangerous animals, and incidents did happen. I had seen a number of accidents caused by these animals. I was hurt, my, you know, practically all the people on our movie had some sort of a, an encounter with uh, one of the animals, with a lion or a tiger. And, um, oh, they were going to name a, a wing at the Palmdale Hospital after us because we were there so much. <laughs> Melanie Griffith, Tippy's daughter, a well-known actor in her own right, was also on the set of Roar. Melanie was very used to having the big cats around, but even then, things can go wrong. Gosh, she was uh, leaned over. She did something. Anyway, one of the cats uh, was a lion, and it got her right across her forehead. I just grabbed her and ran, got out the gate, and put her in the car, and we went to the doctor. And she had to have a whole, you know, all these stitches put in her forehead. Fortunately, he did a really good job. You never know it. So I do know from where I speak, you know, these are not animals that should be in somebody's home as a pet or in, in captivity in somebody's backyard in an eight by 10 cage or, you know, that kind of confinement. I think the American public is becoming smarter. They're becoming more aware of the fact that this is a brute, it's, it's simply brutality to have those animals in a circus. It's not only brutal to keep the strict confinement that they're in, the treatment that they have in order to do those stupid tricks that they make them do is, um, it's obscene. It's horrible, and those poor animals, I'm, I, you know, I'm surprised more people haven't been killed by these animals from the treatment they've had. Shambhala is Tippy's home. She shares the 40 acres with her cats. And in the past, it was common for some of the animals to live in the house, even to the point of sleeping on the bed with her daughter, Melanie. Tigers and lions were their pets, so much so that this image of a tiger jumping through the kitchen window was not set up. It was just one of the many daily events that happened over many years of rearing the big cats. But Tippy reached the conclusion that rather than having them as pets, they should be studied and left to live their natural lives rather than be part of the household. The decision was made to stop the interaction with the animals, especially after the dangers became more noticeable. There was a whole group of women. They worked in college. They wanted to have a photograph with a tiger. And they found the tiger, and the tiger was trained to stand there and be photographed. And they all went up and had their, their uh, picture taken with the tiger and one of them went up and the tiger moved and stepped on the girl's foot and she screamed and the tiger jumped her. 
There are situations that are so frightening and so unnecessary that never should happen. In fact, at one point, I remember gathering my staff around and I said there will be no more contact with any of the animals again. Right now, it's over, it's done. And they were all really angry because they, they really enjoyed having that one-on-one -on -one with the animal, with the lion or the tiger. And they were smart, they knew what they were doing, but that doesn't make a difference. You're dealing with an apex predator who has the top say. They have the top word. It's a great honor to have one of these animals be your friend. To know that that animal recognizes you and likes you, but they're a weapon. They're a weapon and they operate simply on their, on their minds and their instincts. And um, you can't ever forget that. When you're not dealing with a, with a killer, I think any kind of an animal needs to have whoever becomes the, the power of, in, a, in a captive situation must know everything about that species, about what, what does that animal need and what can I give it that they need, not what I feel like giving them. You know, do I, oh well, I've got an eight by 10 cage out in my backyard, that'll be fine. He'll fit in there. That's not enough. No, there's a great deal to know about an animal, any animal that you decide to, to take into your life, no matter what it is. Whether it's, you know, my little cat that just walked by or whatever, what can I give that animal? that will give him a life that he will be content. And if you, if you, if you look at it that way, uh, there probably wouldn't be so many unhappy, um, miserable animals in captivity. I think there are a lot of people who would like to have a wild animal as a pet. You know, of course, it depends on the type of wild animal that you choose. However, if you're choosing uh, an apex predator to become your pet, you're making a very, very like, big mistake, a huge mistake, because the instincts in those animals are in there. It's in their brain, and there's nothing you can do to change that. They will always be a danger. You just don't ever know when it's going to come to the foreground, and most likely you wouldn't have the, the strength or, or the knowledge of how to react to it. I mean, these animals are powerful beyond belief. I don't know, the tensile strength of these animals is one that we can't, in their, in their greatest amount of power that they exude, there isn't any way that you could, you could fight that other than a bullet. I feel very, very grateful that I've been able to have this life with the big cats. I am very grateful that I have managed to become an older woman. I've still got all my limbs and I'm still walking upright because there have been times when I was put in the hospital because you're dealing with an entity that is so powerful and so unforgiving. And, and they're not good at telling you what their plans are. We feel very, very fortunate that we haven't had any serious problems with these animals. And I do not recommend anyone acquiring a lion or a tiger as a pet for any reason. The fascinating thing about them is that you just never know. I mean, you can have 10 years of just absolute 
angel, angel lion, angel tiger, and then bam. It's like playing Russian roulette. Shambhala has its role. It is one place where lions and tigers can feel safe and cared for. Tibi Hedren has done so much for these animals. They are in captivity, but the respect shown to each and every one of them goes without saying. But the final word on owning a predator pet is a warning. With the exotic cats, you're dealing, you're dealing with a serial killer. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues on both sides. Those who know the dangers, but see the benefits. To others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. Standing next to an elephant is an awe-inspiring experience. There is a thrill that comes with being so close to a wild animal, a mix of fear and excitement. No matter how exhilarating it is, there's always an element of danger. Charlie Samet is the founder of Monterey Zoo in Salinas, California. It's because of his experience and incredible way with his animals that working not just so close to, but actually amongst the herd of elephants is even possible. Christy, Paula. Buffy, there must be a convention going on down there that I wasn't made aware of. Hi, girl. Come on. You ever been in a stampede? This is the first time for everything. Hi, girl. Move up. Ah, what's going on here? Hmm? Not a girl. Hmm? That's gross. This is Christy. That's Buffy. Buffy was a carnival elephant. Christy was a circus elephant. And they just both found retirement homes here. I do have to say, though, from the entertainment industries they came from, they came to us very healthy, very sound, um, very well taken care of. So they weren't what I would consider a rescue by any means. They were just done working in those environments and uh, needed a, a place to retire. Had it not been for Charlie, there's no way we would have felt comfortable enough to come so close to these potential lethal heavyweights. Somebody once said that the day you get elephants, your life changes forever. And they couldn't have been more right. So our entire lives revolve around these elephants. If we're on a boat somewhere in the Bahamas and I get a phone call that one of them is down, we're on a plane home. Doesn't matter, nothing comes before the elephants. It's, they're, they're literally your children. They're very demanding. They're, uh, you know, they are dangerous. When you first get them, you have to move into their lives very carefully. This is Paula, she's our old lady, and it's really kind of funny that she's here right now because she's usually so bashful. 
What are you doing? Huh? Charlie started out in law enforcement with no ambition to work with exotic animals. What are you doing? I was a police officer here in Seaside. We served a warrant one night and arrested somebody. And he had a pet mountain lion in the back in his garage. And uh, long short of it, I ended up with it. I took it home that night. Stupidest thing I ever did. I threw a mountain lion in the back of a Toyota pickup truck with a camper shell and took it home with me. I put it in my dog kennel in the backyard. That's where it all started. Hey, what are you doing? Of course, once you've got a mountain lion, why not also get an African lion? Charlie did, and it would change his life completely. The lion turned out to be an extraordinary animal named Joseph, who led Charlie into a new career working with Joseph and other animals in the film and entertainment industry. Still, he certainly never imagined he would end up owning elephants. No. Really? How rude. My personality does tend to lend itself to doing well with them. I'm, you know, fairly aggressive, fairly dominant, and they respond well to that. They're very comfortable with that. So we've always done very, very well together. But I gotta tell you, we've had some horrifying days, sad days that, you know, we've lost two, and uh, it's taken weeks to get over. What are you doing? Hmm? So I guess some could argue that this is probably my favorite place in the world. You know, it's just one of those things where you can't imagine what it's like to have friends like this. Highly intelligent animals, elephants form deep family bonds and live in tight family groups called a herd. Charlie is part of the Monterey Zoo herd. Well, I mean, I actually do feel like one of them. So as soon as they get to me, they do what they need to do, they say hi, and then I'm just one of them, and then they start doing whatever else around me. The thought of them going out our driveway and us not seeing them again just couldn't happen. I couldn't imagine it. Elephants are often seen as placid, gentle animals, but there's no doubt they can pose a very serious threat. Charlie's elephants are hand-picked in a measure that helps ensure the safety of his team. We never brought anything here that we thought was gonna be a threat to our staff. Uh, we do have one, this one here, who had hurt several people before she came here. Um, she didn't kill anybody, but she dumped a few people, so she took a little more work to be around. So my staff doesn't go in with her if I'm not here. Uh, she's just a little pushier, a little typical, if you will but she's also my, my smartest. She's my thinker. Aha, uh -huh, I saw that. What's Butch doing? Now, here's a good example. These were somebody's pets. They were getting expensive. They were getting to be a lot for them to handle. Um, they didn't really have to get rid of them, but they called and asked one day if we didn't have a better situation for them. And the only answer I had was, you know, we could put them in with the elephants and if they got along fine, if they didn't, we'd have to turn around and bring them right back. That was, what, 10 years ago? And there are days we come out here and the elephants are resting their trunks on them. Now you're gonna hear a lot of noise probably when the boy comes forward. changes quickly as there is a sudden commotion from the elephants.
Yeah. Daddy Buffy. Christy. Easy, you had a girl. Buffy back. back. This is Butch. And he's what we call big. What happened is there was a tractor back there that spooked Butch. He obviously told the girls and they ran running over there to help him. Ah, huh. you big dork. So you see, in a lot of the larger organizations, accrediting organizations, what we're doing right now shouldn't be happening. But where I come from in the entertainment industry, you're never gonna remember knowing elephants from looking at them from a barrier in a zoo like you will today. Um, you gotta meet them to know them. And you gotta know them to wanna help save them. And so, hey, there's humans back here. Charlie has worked with exotics for more than 30 years, and the trust these animals have in him is remarkable. Surely, it must take a special sort of person to be so trusted by a herd of elephants. I do think you have to have the right personality for it, um, but they're smart, so there is somewhat of a science to it. And if you apply the science, if you learn it and apply it, it works. Uh, we don't do, we don't handle them the way we used to. It's evolved like everything else. Uh, it's a far, a far kind, kinder training now than it used to be. But for the most part, um, yeah, I'd almost say it's somewhat easier than big cats because they're so smart that it removes a lot of the things you have no control of, and uh, you can, you can actually apply a little tiny bit of trust. They're like a horse. They're, you, know, you, try, you try to get a horse to step on you or to run you over. I had, to ha I had a scene once where I had to have a horse charge into me and knock me down. It took us days to find one that would do it. Um, they just instinctually have no interest in hurting you. Um, but on the other hand, they're like children. You have to be their parent before you can be their friend. So you have to find that balance where they respect you enough to know that they have to listen and they have to behave but there's a reward for it, you know? And they're smart enough to learn real fast. It works a lot better that way. Charlie spent years building up his rapport with his elephants, and keeping elephants is a full-time job. In fact, it's a full-time job for several people. Well, here's the problem. We're working with them all day. They're working, their minds are being kept busy. 24-7, we're working with them. And if you don't, they start pushing you around. And then it gets out of hand. Then you lose control, and that's when they become real dangerous. Butch says, I just want to help. Huh. Huh. Big dork. So, again, you can't go to work every day and spend what little time you have left with an elephant. You, you have to be doing it full time. You have to be doing it professionally for a living to keep them manageable. Um, but on the other hand, do we treat them like pets? We treat everything like pets, but we do it professionally. Spending so much time with his elephants, Charlie is completely at ease with them, but he's always alert to possible dangers. Now, when they all came running, when they all went running that way towards Butch and Christy was in the middle of it, uh, I won't lie to you, I had a little concern there. That's a lot of elephant and very little Christy. So I headed that way. But once again, we've never had a, a bad day. We've never had an incident. They did just what I thought they were gonna do. They ran to Butch because they thought he had a problem. 
Charlie's closeness to his elephants is as much about enriching their lives as it is about enriching his. The best mental stimulation they have is us. The second best mental stimulation they have is the other animals. And the third is themselves, uh, the, the group. So, but they have a lot of things to do here. In the morning, my elephants deliver breakfast to the bed and breakfast. Um, so they go up and they visit with people. Their breakfast baskets have bags of fruit that they get to share with the elephants. So there's the positive. That's why they walk up there with us and they're happy to do it. In the afternoon, people get to come and help us give them baths. And then um, at night, they go to bed. They get their treats and they go into their barns and they go to bed. So. This elephant is normally so shy, she'd be standing back over there and I don't even try to make her come visit people. I have no idea what she's doing right now. She's obviously a camera hog. Paula, what's this about? Paula and Christy came together. Both came from circus. Christy back. Christy back. And there were some things we've changed. Like in circuses, they're not allowed to touch things with their tusks. Whereas in our environment, it was okay. So it took a while to teach her that this was okay. We're, uh, we're far more lenient than they needed to be in circus. So uh, if you will, they get away with a lot more. But we just cut it off at a certain point so that we keep the control and we keep enough respect so it's still a safe activity. There are more than 100 exotic animals at Monterey Zoo, and Charlie claims not to have favorites. Watching him with his elephants, it becomes very obvious that maybe, just maybe, he does. Some, some might say they're the flagship of our zoo. Uh, a lot of elephants, a lot of zoos have elephants, but I, I don't know. I, you know, everybody finds their magic in a different animal. Some people adore elephants, but some people would get on a plane and travel here for nothing more than those sloths. It's, it's just wherever you find your magic. Ethan may only be a child, but he's about to do something many adults wouldn't ever consider. He's about to risk his life. Ethan is at his grandfather's rural property where cattle would not be out of place. But these are not your average cattle. Ethan's grandfather, Dwayne, raises about 40 Watusi cattle on his Utah ranch. Putting a 10-year-old within reach of an animal of this size and temperament is a risk. But for Duane and Ethan, it is a calculated risk. Also known as the cattle of kings, an average Watusi weighs around 1,000 pounds, and their horns are the largest and most dramatic of any breed of cattle. That's exactly what makes them one of the most dangerous even Dwayne is wary. I can get a little bit closer, but this cow's getting ready to have a calf, and I know her. I get halfway over there, she's gonna chase me out. That cow there will just take her baby and run. This new baby here, her mother would probably let us go up to her, but they are threatening because they're showing you. When they have a baby, you respect that, okay? Uh, you do not play with the babies. We play with one here because we know this cow. I mean, she was bottle raised. These cows here, you know that they're not gonna let you play with their baby. These cattle through the years, because of a lot of times, the predators that are in Africa, the hyenas, okay? The mothers have become very, very protective. This little cow behind us, she's showing you, she does not want you to play with her baby. And so as protective as the mothers are, the bulls are really docile. They don't care. You can take that baby, but with the mama, you're not gonna play with it. 
So why does Dwayne let his grandson climb into a pen with one of these potentially lethal beasts? It seems a common theme among owners of dangerous animals. Familiarity breeds trust. This little cow's name is Tina, and she was bottle raised, okay? And that's why she's so gentle. Uh, my grandson Ethan here, he raised her on a bottle. This is his cow. And she just uh, had a little baby calf just three days ago. Do you want to catch the calf, Ethan? Now, you can see the little horns are already starting right here. You can see some real good growth on them as a year old. They'll be uh, a year old. They should be out, you know, anywhere from uh, eight to 10 inches long and have a base on them probably like that. The breed does well in the Utah climate and it is prized for its good looks, its robust and drought hardy nature, and for those massive horns. Uh, we started raising these in 1982. We've uh, learned a lot about the Watusi. And, uh, you know, actually, uh, uh, a few years ago, we, we sent semen back to South Africa, where these animals originally come from, uh, to get new bloodlines in, into a, a herd over there. We've understood that in Africa, they're after, you know, it, it's a thing of economics. Great big horns, great big long horns is harder for the animal to travel, to feed. And so they're in Africa, they're breeding the horns smaller. Yet in America, because we have an abundance of feed, we want our horns bigger. <laughs> and Dwayne certainly succeeded in breeding cattle with bigger horns. The world's largest, in fact. Dwayne's bull, Woody, earned him a place in the Guinness Book of Records for the largest horn circumference ever recorded. Woody's left horn far outsized its right-hand counterpart, growing to a massive circumference of 40 and a half inches. Although it didn't cause him any pain, it weighed so much that Woody would often rest it on the ground. Dwayne has also managed his herd to maintain the breed's distinctive markings. If you'll notice the markings on this cow, she'll have this, uh, she'll have the straight red over the back and the white down the sides. This guy will hold steel. There are pictures of uh, Watusi cattle on Egyptian walls. They date back 7,000 years and they have this same design on them. And y you won't find any other cattle that's got this design on them unless they've got some Watusi bloodlines in them. In Africa, you'll see a lot of the dark red colors in the tribes. The kings, they, they liked uh, the white Watusi. And a white Watusi is very valuable to them. The herds were seen as a status symbol and played a significant role in tribal life. In Africa, the more Watusis you own, it's kind of a, one of those things, I have more than you, or you know, I have a whole bunch of Watusis, and it's kind of like money in the bank in, in Africa. The size of the horns are intimidating. I think in Africa, if a hyena come up, or a lion came to a Watusi cow, you know, they're gonna look at that. They're gonna look at their defense first, you know? And I'm sure, I'm sure depending on what would happen over there, uh, you know, but through the years, the Watusis have developed that real protective instinct to their young. The Watusi's giant horns also help to keep it cool. Hundreds of tiny blood vessels cover the horns close to the surface, allowing heat to escape the body. Uh, where these cows originate from, they take the heat very well. And uh, in the summertime, they'll slick right off, and they've got kind of an oily skin to them, which again, through the years, they've developed uh, kind of a natural pesticide. You can actually rub them and brush them and smell the oil on your hands. They are a hardy cattle. 
Uh, in the winter time here, because we have so much cold, we make sure that they have all the feed they want to eat and we provide shelter for them. They don't have a lot of hair on their ears and they don't have a lot of a long hair like a, a normal cattle would. But you put fat on them, put some meat on them, and they do better. The majority of incidents involving cattle occur on ranches and other sites where people are working with livestock. Hundreds of people are injured and 22 killed each year in the U.S. alone. Knowing the risks of accidents and that the cows can be easily provoked, Dwayne is always mindful of the danger. There is an element of danger. It's the same as any other animal. You take a, a beef cow, they're gonna protect their baby, okay? Some of them are not gonna be as aggressive as others. Okay, the same as a dog that just had brand new puppies. Some of them are gonna let you play with them puppies and some of them are not. Again, maybe the breed of a puppy or the breed of a different cattle is gonna determine how protective they're gonna be with their babies. The Watusis, normally you gotta remember that they're protective. You know, you notice how long the horns are and how big they are. And yet you'll, you'll notice these cows don't use them as like a spear. I've seen so many little tiny sharp horns do so much damage to people and yet these bigger horns like this, they'll actually, when they want another cow out of the road or if they want you out of the road, they'll swing it and use it more like a bat. While Ethan has never been hurt by his cows, Dwayne himself has learned some important lessons the hard way. I had my uh, knee replaced and I got too close to a brand new baby and the mother beat me to the fence. <laughs> and she hit me. And all she did was just, she just hit me and turned around and went back to her baby. And that, you know, that, that's when I learned I can't, I can't move that fast, stay away. <laughs> like any large creature, no matter how familiar you are with the animal, its unpredictability is an ever-present danger. The thing you always want to remember is know your animals, they're having babies, and they're protective. We have a couple of new babies over here. The one, the mother took it and left. The other one is a new mother, and she's kind of, she doesn't really mind if you're, you're around her baby, but you, again, you have to know the animals. It's obvious Dwayne takes great pride in his unusual herd, and he treats his Watusi with just the amount of respect horns like theirs deserve. One thing to remember, if I run, you run. Yes. <laughs> Please run slower than I do. <laughs> <laughs>
they don't see anything wrong, like they don't see that they're doing anything wrong. That amazes me. Lions, Tigers, and Bears was founded in 2002 when Bobby rescued two endangered Bengal tigers. Only Bobby's direct intervention and negotiation with the owner saved them. They were backyard pets. They were housed in a six by 12. Uh, no shade, no shelter. You and I couldn't live like that for five or six years. And the guy was threatening to shoot the animals if the fish and U.S. Fish and Wildlife didn't leave him alone because he considered them his property. But they worked it out and he decided that we could take the tigers and U.S. Fish and Wildlife gave us 30 days. And that's when we built that first small enclosure, you know, because we only had 30 days to get the permits, cross the state lines, build something to house the tigers and get them, and get them here. And that, that was the start. We like to say here they go from rags to riches because the animals we take here are usually the, the ones that nobody else will take. There's no place for them to go because we work all over the country with the first responders. I've probably moved 400 animals, all lions, tigers, bears, cougars in, in the last five years to different sanctuaries across the country. So we work with a lot of sanctuaries, work with a lot of first responders, a lot of state authorities, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Game. Oh, even private owners, you know, and we don't judge. If you have got an animal and you're in over your head and you know, you're ready to find that animal home and you know, 90% of the time, that's what we see happens with private ownership. Seeing tigers for sale in a Walmart parking lot and at cattle auctions and seeing big cat cubs used for photo opportunities, Bobby knew she was on the right path. You know, I went to one place on the East Coast, me and my, my friend, and the one photo facility had 22 cubs. So you know they, they can only use them till they're, they're so big and then they've got to replace those cubs with more, more cubs. So where do all the, all the babies go? I believe some of them go to canned hunts, which is, you know, small area for people to shoot for a trophy, or they go as backyard pets, they're disposed of. Some of them are probably just killed and buried. There's no federal tracking of these animals. The lucky ones get to come to a legitimate sanctuary where they're not gonna be bred and at least get their dignity back and, and live out their life. The majority of animals Bobby now takes care of have been rescued from private owners and even from other sanctuaries. An appointment with the vet is one of their first experiences at their new home. Most of the animals that we go in and get, they've never had any medical care, never, no dental. Like the, the two leopards we have right now in the quarantine, we've spent six months in medical, you know, and then the female couldn't put any weight on her front feet because she had been declawed all the way around to, so they could use her for the photo ops. And so she was literally trying to walk on her back feet. So when we went in to do the surgery on her feet, we ended up finding a, you know, a lump on her, on her abdomen, and it ended up being a mass on her uterus. And so you know, it just seems like one thing after another medically for her. And we're still trying to get her up here with the other cats since she's been here a year. And that looks like it's cleared up. So that's usually the best sign. The white tiger cub also had severe health problems when first rescued. And after weeks in quarantine, her final vet check before going to a new enclosure is a great game. Now that she's, her lesions are growing, or coming back. We can do another fungal culture with the, that little DTM stuff. Have you seen it? It's like a special auger. Bobby's 93-acre sanctuary is now home to a variety of rescued animals. And for many of them, the sanctuary was the first time they had ever seen the sky or felt sunshine. This is the first time the white tiger cub has ever been on grass. But rescuing exotic animals is dangerous work. Honestly, I think the first few weeks when I worked around these animals, I didn't think they were as dangerous as they are. I think the fear comes in after you experience 
you know, a few things. And I think for myself, the danger is when we go into dangerous places and get animals out. Because a lot of times the cages are so dangerous, we can't dart because if they jump, they'll go through, go through the cage. Or people have them housed in their dining room or their garage or their basement. They never really think about getting the animal out. Like there's no way to get a transfer cage down the basement stairs or in their little gates. Our cages don't fit through. You know, those are the more dangerous circumstances for my staff. Rather than send her staff into dangerous situations, Bobby often puts herself in the line of fire. And when I first started working with the animals, I worked free contact inside the cage. I have just chose not to get anybody hurt. And a lot of times when you're rescuing animals, we don't even know, you know, these animals past, how they were raised. It's just better safe than sorry. Because the way we've set up everything here is pretty safe. They work in twos. Uh, they'll shift the animal, which means they'll put it in an empty cage. And then the second person goes back and checks all the locks, checks that it's empty, and then they'll go in and clean. And then the same thing, when they go to put them back in the cage, they'll check the locks and then put it back, and then the second person will go back and check the lock. But that doesn't mean that human error can't happen because if something happens, it would be human error. Somebody will make a mistake. That's why your buddy's so important because that person has to have your back. These animals could kill you in a second. <laughs> in a second. For Bobby, the benefits far outweigh the risk. Sometimes an animal's rehabilitation requires a lot of patience. You know, like we had one bear we brought from Ohio, and he was fine as long as you kept him locked up. Like when we brought him in the trailer, we all the way across the country, we'd open the door and feed him, and he was fine, clean him out, and no problems. And then we brought him here, we always put animal in the quarantine and do all their medical, he was fine. But when we put him out in the habitat and opened the door to let him out, he was scared to death. And he'd just run back and forth and pace. So we would just open the door for 15 minutes and the next day for an hour, and then you know a couple weeks later for half a day and, until the door was just left open. And then finally he would touch the dirt because he'd never touched dirt before. And then finally he would go out, in and out, you know, make sure his little safety place was still there. Now he uses the whole habitat. Bobby's priority is always the welfare of the animal. But how is her sanctuary any different to a zoo? But I think one of the biggest questions we get here is why don't you give the animals to the zoo? And I think we do something totally different than a zoo or two totally different organizations. But a lot of people don't realize these animals originated as surplus animals from the zoos from the breeding programs, and that's how they got out into the private sector. Bobby has strong views on the breeding and keeping of captive animals, views that have been established through many years of experience and firsthand knowledge. There's approximately 220 AZA zoos in our country, and that's who holds the SSP plan, the Species Survival Plan, in our country. So supposedly this is the legitimate breeding that's going on in our country. You know, that's 220 zoos breeding. It's a lot. And you know, these are not animals that can go back in the wild. So there's really not much conservation value. The breeding is for the animals to stay in captivity. You can't put a lion or a tiger or a bear back out. They're gonna walk right up to you for food. And I don't think a lot of people realize that these animals are not being put back out in the wild. There is no proven plan to put them back that, that's working. And a lot of them, they don't know how to be a tiger. I've brought bears in here that are scared to death of space. You know, it took us six months to get the white tiger to walk out in the open space because she had never been out of a 10 by 10 and she was used for nothing other than breeding. So when she came here and there's the green grass and the pool, and the, she was afraid of the waterfall. So it just, a lot of TLC, a lot of time. And you know, now she'll use the, the whole habitat, but it took a long time. You know, one of the most important things we can give our animals is dirt. You know, it's like the difference of standing on a tile floor all day versus standing on carpet all day. There's a huge difference. And it makes a huge difference in arthritis and, and how their joints feel, and especially when it's cold. Seeing distressed and mistreated animals takes an emotional toll. And Bobby also struggles with the idea that even the sanctuary she offers isn't ideal. 
it's just a glamorized prison. That's what it is. You and I wouldn't want to live in there. I mean, it's beautiful, but you wouldn't want to stay in there for life. You know, when I first started working around the animals, I really didn't see anything wrong with the way they were housed and, you know, people having them as pets. And I think it just grows on you. Like myself, I've been, you know, working around these animals almost every single day since 1990. And it's really obvious they don't belong in a cage. So part of Bobby's goal is to ensure that the animals live as closely as possible to how they would in the wild. They don't make good pets. It's, I think it's selfish, you know, and that's one thing that I've questioned myself about, you know, am I being selfish by, you know, wanting to have the animals? And I had to like get in check and make sure that there's a reason for every animal to be here. You know, just like the little bobcat that we took in Diego, if he could have went back out in the wild, that would have been the best thing for him. But unfortunately he can't go back out in the wild. So he needs a place to, to live out his life. Rescued grizzly bear Albert suffered from malnutrition that caused permanent neurological problems. And not all of the rescues turn out well. They've destroyed part of his life. You know, the MRI shows he has no pain, but he still has to really think and rock back and forth to get up. And then he has to really think, you know, his brain has to think where he's putting his, his paws to, to walk. I've, of all the animals I have moved, I had to euthanize one lion. And it, that was very heartbreaking because it was just a big, beautiful lion and he was literally dragging his back legs, you know, to the, to the point where he was open wounds, you know, from drag, he could not move his back legs at all. That, that was hard. And it was really hard because he was in with two females. So not only did we have to euthanize him, but then we had to move the females out of their home. That was hard. Bobby will continue to provide safe and enriching environments for abused and neglected animals already in captivity, leaving future generations to continue to ponder the question of finding a better solution. I always tell my students and my interns, they're the ones, the younger generation, they're gonna make the decision. Do we work on saving the wild tigers in the wild? Because we only have about 3,000 tigers left in the wild. And it would be really nice to keep the ones that we have in the wild protected. Or do we continue to breed these animals for nothing more than to live in a cage? It will go to that generation. And again, they'll, they'll make that decision. But these animals, they live 20 years. So, you know, I figure I can do this a good 20, 30 more years. And, you know, hopefully there'll be some more laws in place to protect the animals and there won't be as many animals in need of sanctuary. I mean, that would be ideal. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. There are 48 animals that we had to put down. 
Those animals included one wolf, six black bears, two grizzly bears, nine male lions, eight lionesses, one baboon, three mountain lions, and 18 tigers. I remember it all happening on a Wednesday evening at about 10 till 7 uh, is when I received the first phone call. We became international news by the next morning. It was just a disaster waiting to happen. Zanesville is a sleepy town in Muskingum County, Ohio, with a population of just over 25,000 people. Until 2011, Zanesville was best known for its Y Bridge and many beautiful parks. It's one of the last places in the world you would expect to find an exotic pet owner with so many animals. But on one fateful day, the worst example of exotic pet ownership brought Zanesville to the attention of the world. Zanesville is a very small, agricultural, very family-oriented community. Everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows what everybody's doing. It's a small town. One of these small town residents was lifelong inhabitant Terry Thompson, a decorated Vietnam War veteran whose main role had been as a machine gunner on a Huey helicopter. His wife, Marion, was an avid horse rider and a local school teacher. Many locals knew the Thompsons kept exotic animals, but Terry was better known as the man who flew a light plane under the Y Bridge. A notorious hoarder whose property was scattered with old cars and a dangerous mix of guns and wild exotic animals. Terry had drawn attention to himself many times over the years with his unusual behavior. Local police sergeant Todd Canaval has vivid recollections of Terry Thompson. We had dealt with him off and on. He had just been released from prison just a few days before this incident on a firearms charge. We had dealt with him in the past also about uh, the animals, just checking on their welfare and the safety of the public as far as the containment systems that uh, he provided them and such. He had several animals then, 70 some I believe. He had tigers, he had lions, he had black bears, he had grizzly bears, he had different apes. One time he had camels, numerous horses. Uh, there was just animals everywhere. In the garage there was a couple of tiger cages. There was a bedroom where a, a mountain lion I think lived. Um, there was monkeys in the basement in a cage. Yeah, Terry was different. Terry always kind of pushed the envelope, but Terry was Terry. I, he was never really disrespectful to me or anything. I was always concerned that either Terry or Marion would be attacked by the animals. I realized they had a good rapport with the animals, but they're still wild animals, and something would trigger them. I figured maybe someday we would go up there and find one of them severely injured or killed. The sergeant's fear was realized on the evening of October 18, 2011. Terry's notoriety was about to extend beyond the small community of Zanesville. As the day drew to a close, it is believed that he cut open the cages of more than 50 of his wild animals, setting them free before taking his own life. Senator Troy Balderson was born and bred in Zanesville and had been a member of the Ohio House of Representatives since 2009. This incident was a trigger for him to amend the legislation surrounding exotic pet ownership in Ohio. About a mile down the road that evening, there was a, a tournament soccer game going on. There could have been a lot of tragedy, and, and, and there wasn't. For the most part, no one was injured. That was one of the biggest accomplishments that I feel that, we, that came out of the situation. next thing I saw was a black figure. It turned out it was a bear. Sam Kopchak is a retired school teacher and lived next door to Terry. That evening, he was out in his own yard attending his own horse, Red, when he saw Terry's horses acting strangely. I saw the horses that were over there. It's probably about 60 horses, I estimate, that they had. They were going around a circle. And I said, well, they're not supposed to do that. Something's going on, you know. Then Sam saw something even more out of the ordinary. 
I actually got red up there by the corner. We walked down through here and I just felt like something was looking at me and I kind of did, turned to the left and big male African lion, he came down. This is about the spot he was uh, sitting. He just sat down right there and just kind of, you know, like that. And uh, I just kept on going and I never looked back till I got down to the white fence with my barn. And then after I was down by my barn, he was pacing back and forth on the fence. As you can see, this is like a seven strand, bob, not a bob wire, just a smooth wire. And if he wanted to leap over that, he was big enough that he could have leaped over that fence. What Sam soon realized was that the lion was just the beginning of what was about to unfold. So I actually saw like six animals, the original bear and then the uh, lion, the male lion and the, and the female lion and the, another bear and uh, the wolf went by and the tigers. Sheriff's office. Yeah, I think I just seen one. It looked like a jaguar or a wolf or something. I received a call that uh, some of the animals were out. We weren't sure to the extent of, of the situation, but I was requested to come to the scene. When we arrived, uh, we were advised by one of the patrol sergeants that he had been up in the, the compound area uh, looking for Terry or Marion and had uh, seen a body laying out in a field. And that was our first priority, determine who it was and if they were injured or deceased. We were first approached by, uh, I believe it was two tigers come out of a barn towards us. And as they rushed the truck, we were forced to dispatch them. Then we arrived in the area of where the body was, and it was quite apparent whoever it was was deceased. There was a white uh, tiger chewing on them. About that time, we were advised that there was two cats ready to exit the compound area on the south side of the property. So we had to go over there and dispatch those animals. I didn't know how many were out, but once we got up there, I had made contact with the sheriff that appeared that everything had been turned loose. And I mean, there was bears, there was tigers, there's lions running everywhere. It was a huge concern because it was later in the evening, you know, if it got dark, the only thing securing that property is just a regular barbed wire fence like you would have for cattle or whatever. You know, these animals would have easily cleared that, and in a short time, they'd have been in populated areas and injuring, you know, humans. There was some that had escaped the perimeter, but we had set up officers along the perimeter to contain that. I discussed with the sheriff what our situation was. There was no other option except to dispatch the animals. We started engaging the animals at different distances. Some were shot 30 to 50, 70 yards away. But then it came to where we had to go to the barn areas and that because they were in there. And yeah, we had one lioness come at us. Uh, we ended up having to shoot her and she was stopped probably three feet from us when she finally went down. Most of us had AR-15 shooting the 223 round. I was concerned that maybe there wasn't enough power, but after we engaged a few animals and saw that, you know, the, the rifle was doing its job, then I felt a little better that, you know, we, we could be safe. It was a coordinated effort to try to keep everything safe and, and contained. Sam became an unwitting bystander to a grisly scene. I saw the deputies pull in, and my first thing was, well, there's gonna take more than two deputies to take care of this, because if, if all those animals are out, and uh, I saw a truck, and there was several, probably four, deputies on the back with, with the guns, and uh, they drove back there, and within a few minutes, I could hear shooting. It just sounded like a big fireworks display. It just kept on. It seemed like it went on forever. I saw them going across the field, just like hunters, you know, with a gap between them with their guns. 49 animals that they killed, and one missing, and six that were in the house. So it's 56 total animals that were there. It was quickly determined that it would have been impossible to control all these wild animals using tranquilizers. And the decision to use live ammunition undoubtedly saved human lives. To the best of my knowledge, there was one tiger left and the veterinarian there, I think her name was Wolf, she went over and got a perfect shot with a tranquilizer hitting perfectly where she wanted to. I mean, she, I guess, made the determination how much to give him, you know how big he was, and he was in the 
weeds and so forth, and he come immediately charging out of there. And if the deputies weren't there, he'd have probably got her. They had to shoot it. When it comes down to a situation like that, I realize there, uh, you know, the animals have rights, but humans have more. And you just, you, you couldn't justify uh, risking human life for, for the animals. They had to be somewhat scared. They were out of their containment systems, uh, running loose. You just didn't know how they were gonna react. You could kind of surmise that he had let them go, but it wasn't until, you know, the investigation was completed later we were pretty much, we, we knew that's what had happened. You know, even if you'd found them in some of their containment systems, he cut the fences so that you couldn't recontain them. I, I'm glad it turned out that no one got hurt. To have that many animals loose, we were just very lucky that we caught it when we did. You're not ready for something like that. Uh, we had to deal with what we had to do, and that's why I think they've come out with legislation on this kind of uh, practice. It's just, it's not feasible. Uh, safety for the public or for the animals. Immediately following the incident, Ohio ultimately banned the ownership of exotic animals and their transportation across state lines. We don't want to see these animals lose their lives over something like this. They are wild. I mean, the, these animals are not domesticated. They are wild animals. That's what I kept trying to focus on. That's what I did focus on when we did this legislation. They're wild. We knew something needed to be done. Um, the administration knew that something needed to be done, and we had to stand up and, and, and do the right thing for the state of Ohio. And that's what, you know, I had to make that decision also. Challenging as I knew it was going to be, I knew there was going to be a lot of negative feedback from taking on a piece of legislation like this. You know, before I started doing this legislation, I did travel the state of Ohio and going to sanctuaries that, you know, that's the challenging part. There were people that had sanctuaries that were doing it respectfully. You wanted to look at both sides of it, but you also had to take the responsibility to make the right judgment, to set the mind of we weren't going to do this. We weren't going to allow you to have wild animals without certain restrictions that you had to abide by. We had a facility at the Department of Ag that was built out there that took in the people that could not find places for their wild animals. They could take them to the Department of Ag. Um, we stored them there until we could find some place to go. Um, there are good places out there with the facilities that are, are capable of, of handling these animals. And, um, you know, it's some place for these owners can, that can take their animals that they can still have a relationship with. They can still go visit. They can still go feed. I think that was important to a lot of them. It's, you know, it's still there and always will be there, you know, in your mind about it. I'm just so thankful that nobody got hurt, and it's terrible that he had to die. It's a very sad thing. All those animals are buried back there along the, the, the road where they buried them. I mean, they dug a big, put them all in there. You see, they laid them all. See, that was the bad picture on the internet that made people irate because all those animals, when you saw that, that scene, and the, the sheriff was very upset. They don't know who took those pictures, and they put them out. But I mean, that, the, but they had to put them lay them out so they would know they had them all. And the, and the caretaker was the one, like I said, that was counting the heads and telling them, well, yeah, we do have them all or whatever with it. But that made it a terrible scene too, because you see the see all of them lying there, you know, like that. So it wasn't too nice to see. But they're beautiful animals and you hate to see them get killed. But if you got a choice between the animals and people, you got to save the people and that's what they did. Exotic pets take all shapes and forms, and often the owners have an incredible and very special bond with their animals. And this is undeniably the case with Lisa. Oh, baby money. You see this little itty bitty baby, as cute as can be. But that little itty bitty baby is gonna tear you apart. No point should you ever feel complacent with a monkey you've never met before. This monkey was only after the owner's camera, but it's an intense reminder this is a wild animal. If you buy a monkey, be prepared that you are going to get attacked. Lisa and Mugwai have been friends for 24 years, 
a commitment that's incredibly rewarding, but also very demanding. Unless you're an educated monkey owner, you're in for a disaster. Every single monkey bites, and it's gonna bite you, no matter what you do. So, you know, a monkey has to be tamed, and then it can be trained. So it's a process that you have to go through, and it takes a lot of taming to become a good monkey. When you have a good monkey, it's easy to make new friends. But if your monkey is a little wild, it may bite strangers. Many vets will only examine a monkey when it's sedated to avoid any unwelcome wounds. When these animals hit six years old and start going through puberty, they can become wild, vicious, dangerous animals. You know, the training that they've often learned, the domestication they've learned at that early age, that pretty much goes out the window, and you're dealing with literally a whole different animal. Monkeys frequent the tourist circuit in Thailand, and they may seem super cute, but you always need to keep your guard up and pay attention to what may become aggressive behavior. Don't be deceived by their so-called friendly antics. These monkeys are wild. A lot of these animals carry diseases that are communicable to people. They're called zoonotic diseases. And a zoonotic disease is any disease that can be transferred from pet or animal to person. And some of the diseases are quite serious. Non-human primates carry herpes and monkeypox and Ebola. So again, if you don't know what you're doing, sanitation, care, so forth, then that's something that you can take on or a family member or a friend who's visiting because the disease is now spread around your home. You have to step back and look at all that's involved, do your research and education, depending on the pet and what's involved. The take home here is never should it be taken lightly owning an exotic pet, regardless of the size or the species. We still have monkeys in the United States that are carrying disease. Probably only a third out of the 40,000 monkeys out there and growing each and every day, they are not vaccinated. We've been vaccinating these monkeys for years and years and years. And we do a serology test to screen everything that imaginable that they could possibly have. This isn't a pet for someone keen on owning a low maintenance animal. Monkeys can be a handful. She's very calm though. She'll sit and she'll watch a movie with you, have some popcorn. She doesn't get into a lot of things. She used to when she was uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> so over the age of of 12 to 13, then they really start to be a part of your life. Capuchin monkeys reach maturity around five years, at which point their personality can become even more demanding and potentially aggressive. If you're the prime carer, you really need a lot of training to make sure the relationship stays on track. She is eight pounds. So that eight pounds coming at you full force. That's a lot of monkey there. Really, seriously, it's a lot of monkey. She's, she's strong. A monkey on the attack is a situation to be avoided at all costs. However, for Lisa, this inherent wild animal instinct saved her life. They're very smart, yes. I was attacked. I came home from work and I was attacked in my garage and my monkey saved my life. A man had grabbed me from behind. Inside my house, on the second floor, they have their two monkey rooms. And if it wasn't for all four of them that came downstairs and attacked him, I, I probably wouldn't be alive today. All I gotta do is give her one sign. And it's uh, she becomes the wild animal that everyone sees. I love her to pieces. We are two people that are inseparable. Capuchins are most notably renowned as pets of organ grinders and were in fact introduced as exotic pets from their home territories of Central and Northern South America. These mischievous rascals certainly kept the audience entertained. Plus, they had the ability to carry a cup around to collect money. From this, their popularity grew for those wanting an unusual pet. There's pros and cons where exotic pets are concerned because the, our biggest problem is the caretakers and owners that own them 
don't have the education that they need. Lisa has trained around three to 4,000 monkeys, often referred to as the monkey whisperer. Lisa is the go-to person if your monkey is misbehaving. When I take her to train other monkeys, she helps. You know, it's great for the other monkeys to see that they can actually be loved, that they can be touched without being hurt, or, you know, the mistakes that these owners make by using gloves and using weapons and the shock collars and things like that. I mean, it's still going on today. Owning a monkey is a commitment for up to 30 years or more. While capuchins are the most intelligent of the New World monkeys, in the human world, they are like toddlers. But that's how naive these people are. They think that they're humans and they can treat them as humans. But they're wild animals. They have to have a habitat. Not a little tiny birdcage, a habitat. So they can be free. They can jump, they can climb, they can do, they have things to do all the time. Muggy's surrounded by so many. You know, they need their own kind to be able to communicate, to socialize, to groom each other. That is a healthy animal in captivity. I have a huge facility. A lot of people have come to my door and dropped their monkeys off. A lot of them came that way, and all the monkeys that are there have either been injured, they've been rescued, or they've been dropped off. You have to be a very experienced person to have a primate. It's a huge responsibility. I do believe that any of the larger monkeys should not be kept as, quote, pets. But I do not call them pets, I call them companions. These devoted companions may need a lot of ongoing training, but just like humans, they are always capable of a little monkey business. I studied animals, I studied monkeys, their data, the brain waves, their anatomy. And because they're so human, you open her up, she's just like me. You know, so it's so beautiful, a creature that can do anything that we can do. I mean, she started my van and her and Madeline ran it into my house in the garage. So this is how smart they really are. You know, you cannot turn your back. Mugwai may be a troublemaker at times, but she also knows when to be well-behaved, especially when there's the opportunity to go toy shopping for her birthday. But first, a quick sketch as a thank you gift. After all, Muggy is a very polite little monkey and doesn't want to turn up to any event empty-handed. Her name is Mugwai. Mugwai. Hi, Mugwai. Happy birthday. She'll be 24. Oh, 24, wow. that's amazing. What? This for you. She painted it. Oh, are you kidding me? That is awesome. <laughs> Outstanding. Oh, nice. Thank you. That is really cool. She painted it. Ron may not have a monkey in his store every day, but he's certainly keen to help Muggy find the best present she's ever had. Yeah, we're good. Let's go shopping. <laughs> you like that one? No, no interest in that one. No? Okay. No. When it comes to shopping, Muggy is a girl who knows what she wants and certainly loves all the attention. Hey! Want to check it out? Come here. Come here. Oh, Aww, look at the little princess in her chair. <laughs> look how cute you are. Look how cute. <laughs> you got a chair. You ready? Come on. Let's go. All right. Have something like this. Try as she might, Muggy's not listening to Ron's sales pitch for these toys. Up! Let's go! Up, up! All right. Right here, it's like a little Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> what do you think, sweetie? Oh my goodness! Looks like Ron has finally ticked all the boxes.
Thrill Seeker? Thrill Seeker Yellow doesn't seem to hold as much appeal. However, the scooter looks like fun. Okay, hang on. Got a good grip of us? Ready? You got a steer. <laughs> yeah! Ah! <laughs> After all that adventure, it's time for a quick pit stop. Lurch are your favorite? <gasps> oh. What do you think of those, baby? Her ultimate favorite candy. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, yeah. Her the texture and the creation yeah, yeah. and everything. I got a few more for you, Bubba. There's a lot of controversy oh, yeah. about owning a monkey. Not all monkeys have a great reputation. And many certainly aren't as well behaved as Mugwot. But it seems the key is all about good parenting. All right, sweetie, your total is $64.94. You see it right there? Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be for your new car, your new Jeep. What do you think about that? You going to be a journey girl? You can go on journeys with mama? <laughs> Yum yums. It comes down to how well they are taken care of, and that is the big picture. I get judged every single day. But what it comes down to, when they lose control of that monkey, who do they call? You can call me names, you can say whatever you want to say, but at the end, you're going to be begging for my help. You know, and and am I going to turn that person away because they were, they were crappy to me? No, no, I'm going to help because it, it does not matter. I don't care about them. I care about those animals. That's what really matters to me. The Greater Winniewood Exotic Animal Park in Oklahoma hosts some of the country's most interesting big cats. And is home to star personality, Joe Exotic. Originally, I was, I was born in Kansas. I grew up in Wyoming. I moved to Texas, was there 16 years, and I ended up here uh, when my brother got killed in 1997. Uh, we built this facility as a memorial to him, because. His dream was to go to Africa. I've been doing this 32 years now. Started actually almost 16 years before I moved here. And that's what me and my brother had was an exotic pet store. And, and that was where I got my first lion, uh, 16 years before we started it. I have built myself my own prison. Kids, you can't leave here. I went to Walmart three years ago. Uh, came back and, and one of my staff members lost an arm. This is Bobby at the DW Zoo. Uh -huh. I need a helicopter. I've got an employee that was attacked by a tiger, and he's hurt bad. I need, is it care flight, I guess? Uh, we have to go back here. Okay. I will help them help that way, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That's something that I never, ever want to see again. So I've never left here since. It's a potentially fatal attraction, but Joe's captivation with predatory animals has persisted. Animals and it has always been a fascination to me. Um, I, I picked up sick animals when I was little and pretended I was a vet and nursed them back to health. So it's just kind of something I've been born with. Ah, uh, the showman side. Uh, you know, it's just because I, I, I say what most people are thinking and they're too scared to, to say it. And uh, I have fun. Uh, anything I do, you can give me a bowl of Cheerios and a glass of milk and I can, I can motorboat around that bowl all day long. Entertaining, I, I love to entertain. I saw tiger. Joe's love of entertaining has led him to pursue many careers in the spotlight, which have seen him adopt the stage name of Joe Exotic. Most recently, he's combined his passion for exotic animals with his successful country music career. 
singing is kind of an escape from reality to me, and, and I can write songs about uh, how I feel, the way people act, uh, you know, uh, misery, happiness, and, and that's just something that I use for an escape. Sure, he's a little eccentric, but he does have ambition. In 2016, he ran for president against Donald Trump. I laid in bed one day during the presidential election, and, you know, common people like you and I never get heard. I, it, it, that's a fact. You can vote all day long. You can send a letter. You'll never get a response. And if you do, it's a, it's a form letter. Uh, so I laid in bed one night, and I was like, how in the hell do I ever have a voice? Uh, Woke up the next morning, filled out my federal papers, signed up to run for president. And, you know, I learned more in 11 months of running for president of the United States than I did in 12 years of high school. So we gave him a run for the money. You know, people are like, you, you lost. I, I didn't lose anything. A, a hundred million people know who I am. Uh, I got my voice out there. I got my opinions out there. I, I think we won a lot. Give me money with it. Joe's first love, however, has and always will be his animals. The first time I rescued a tiger, and I still have her, she's 27 years old. That was my first real connection. And when you help something, there's a much different connection there than if you buy something and try and make it a pet. Taking unwanted abused animals, I have a whole lot more sense of being able to work with them. I'm like their savior, and they know that. We are here to educate the world, entertain people, and take care of animals. I don't like the word sanctuary. We're a zoo. We're open to the public. We buy, sell, breed, take in unwanted animals. You know, there's everything here. We have 450 plus animals. We have everything from Michael Jackson's alligators to, to Steve Martin's chimpanzees to just John Doe's tiger out of his backyard. We have a, a diverse family of animals of all kinds and people of all kinds. People ask me every day, well, you know, how do you train these tigers? I don't train my tigers. I walk among my tigers. And, and if they want to be petted, we pet. If they want to be loved on, we love. If they're laying over in, in the shade or the sun, and they have their ears back and they just want to be left alone, they're left alone. The American Veterinary Medical Foundation states that once in captivity, no wild or exotic animal species should be re-released into the environment. For many of Joe's animals, his zoo is their final home, and he believes this is the safest place for them. The only safe place for an animal in the United States is in a cage, in a zoo, or somebody's yard that can properly care for them. Unfortunately, society in today's world won't allow even a rehabilitated animal to be turned back loose in a wild. We just had a bear in Oklahoma a couple months ago, a wild bear, come up on a lady's porch in town. I oh, said, so what do they do? They kill it. You know, they, they hunt it down and kill it because it came into town. And this is the most important thing that, that I hope anybody gets out of anything that I'm saying, is animals in the wild have no rights, none whatsoever. We trash our oceans, we, we, we build cities in, in our wetlands and our, and our mountains. We took away their habitat. But if you properly care for and you don't take away from the wild, I believe any animal that's bred in captivity, you have a right to own as long as you take care of it. While animals like the black bear are native to the states, other animals such as lions and tigers have been imported, making their care and welfare once they arrive a hot topic. The placing of exotic animals in wildlife sanctuaries and the motivation behind doing so is a highly contentious issue. The federal government of the United States, and this is what we're working on right now, has tigers and lions on our Federal Endangered Species Act. 
the our Endangered Species Act was designed in 1972 to protect native species of our lands. Tigers, lions, kinkajous, orangutans have no business on our endangered species list. Okay, but put them on our endangered species list, what that has done is, you know, private citizens are not allowed to possess, own, breed, interstate commerce, which means sell across state lines or anything like that. Two months ago, you saw online that there's too many tigers in America. A month later, we put them on the federal endangered species list. In the meantime, they ship a circus tiger in from Peru to America and, and 13 lions from another country. Somebody's got to make up their damn mind. Uh, have we got too many in America? Do they belong on the, on the endangered species list in America? And why are we shipping them in? Because it makes good rescue stories. We rescued a tiger from Peru, and we need to raise $33,000 to care for this damn thing. And they euthanized it six months later because the money train ran out. As yet, there's no central database or requirements for exotic animal owners to record and report on the disposal of animal bodies. The recommendation is for the bodies to be cremated to ensure animal parts don't find their way onto the black market. Between 2000 and 2004, more than $100 million was made from the sale of wild animal imports, making it a lucrative business. Everyone to speak his mind, Joe considers it's the money rather than the care and protection of animals that drives many sanctuary owners in the U.S. It is a controversial opinion, and whether he is right or not is yet to be determined. There's 2,800 registered tigers in America. There's less than 3,000 in the wild. Every sanctuary in this country is the same one. It has nothing to do with helping animals. All you have to do is take the board of directors' names and pull up their tax records of what property they own. And I'll guarantee you, every one of them lives in over an $800,000 house. This ain't about animals. This is about money. Understand this. If you raise money for animals at a particular nonprofit facility, it better be spent for them animals. See, here in America, you have to be licensed by the United States Department of Agriculture and be inspected to make sure that you're taking care of everything right and following protocols and vet care and all that stuff. Only if you're open to the public. Now, if you're a sanctuary that doesn't exhibit and you're close to the public, God only knows what's going on behind them walls. Okay, and see, that's another problem with, with most of these sanctuaries and these organizations is they want animals in sanctuaries with no contact. How would you like to be thrown in jail and never touched or never loved on? As much as Joe loves his animals, they remain at heart wild and unpredictable creatures. Some of Joe's most dangerous residents are his bears, and he knows all too well the potential risk of keeping these unpredictable animals in close proximity to humans. I've not had good encounters with bears. We actually have uh, four grizzlies here and, and three black bears. They're just as personable as any other animal. Ozzy, who is our largest grizzly bear, uh, we'll set up and give you a high five and, and French kiss you and everything else. Uh, Ozzy came from Kansas uh, and back in the early 2000s when Kaylee Hildebrand was killed by a tiger getting her senior picture taken. Uh, Kansas panicked and passed some laws and made it illegal for private owners to have animals and that's where Ozzy arrived to us from was, was a, a private owner who just had some exotic animals and this bear loved that guy. Uh, and when he arrived here, he was probably six feet tall, standing up on his back two feet, and this guy walked him around the park just like it was a dog. He is 100% lovable, as long as that fence is there. That is as much his security blanket as it is for our safety. <laughs> wow, guys, yeah. 
I've been in with him. He's a 100% different bear. He weighs about 1,400 pounds. Uh, you know, during the summertime, they eat less, they lose a little bit of weight. Uh, during the wintertime, they, they eat more and they put it on. Uh, for a Syrian grizzly, he's, he's pretty large. Bears are not as predictable as a lot of animals are, in my opinion. Bears is something that I, I've really never specialized in working with because they're just so moody. I had a black bear at one time uh, that we raised called Little Bear, and she grew up in the gift shop years ago. And she got out of her enclosure uh, one day and went back to the gift shop and uh, decided to wreak havoc in the gift shop because she was playing. You know, everything on the shelves had to come off the shelves. And I put a harness on her and went to walk her out. And bears are much different than tigers. When they lay their ears down and they do that, you're gonna get bit. Bears may be different to tigers, but that doesn't mean tigers pose any less of a threat to Joe and his team. There's days they don't feel good. There's days they woke up in a bad mood. Like I said, uh, I've built myself my own prison. If people think that you do this because you're getting rich, <laughs> they really need to come work here. <laughs> Uh, you, you can't leave. I wouldn't change it for the world. I have a goal in my life, and that is to be somebody and accomplish something. And that's the way I was raised, and, and that's what I'm gonna do. I saw my brother killed at the age of 32 years old. I buried my first husband here uh, at the age of 32 years old. And, and I'm gonna leave this world leaving my mark. I've dealt with so much death in my life, and life's too short to get tied at. So, so my personality is, I, I, I laugh all the time. <laughs>